Hey, what's up world? Welcome to The Lead Creative. Creating your most inspired work and building your audience takes commitment. The best-selling author of 20 books that have been translated into 37 languages, Seth Golden, joins me to talk about how you can constantly create and ship your most inspired work. You may be familiar with some of his books, including Purple Cow, Poke the Box, The Dip, Lynchpin, and his latest work, The Practice, which we talk about in this episode. Among other things, we discuss how brands and marketers can build their smallest viable audience and still remain relevant and inclusive. This is The Lead Creative. Seth, when we last spoke in 2010, you just launched your latest book at the time, which was Lynchpin. And one of the things I got away from that book was the ability to face resistance and in spite of fear to create my work and build on it. Fast forward about 12 years, you've recently released your latest book called The Practice. How do these two books complement each other and how does The Practice take the idea of shipping your work forward? First, it's so great to see you again. 12 years is like <laughs> 400 years in, in modern days. <clears throat> I Absolutely. hope that you and yours have been well. What a, what a ride it's been all around the world. And it has been. It's been a what, crazy what a one. Miracle. Yeah, thanks for making the time. <laughs> I mean, we're 15,000 miles apart, whatever it is, 10,000 miles. And it's like we're here. So even though the world is crazy, there are miracles everywhere we look. Uh, this so is true. With that said, Lynchpin was about me exploring art and gifts and leadership. And what it did was outline a possibility for the future, which is here now, for individuals to make a difference. But what it didn't address is how we feel inside when we're doing that work. And so the purpose of the practice was instead of focusing on the outside of the person as leader, it was the inside, the narrative, the way we talk to ourselves when we decide to make a difference. Okay. Okay. And it was, uh, I mean, it's been a really great book to read in this time and also just coming out of the, the pandemic, which was a very important time. And one of the excerpts I, I took away from the practice is, is this idea um, where of, of, of you saying that there's no such thing as writer's block. What would you say holds us back from us constantly creating and shipping our work? Well, let's uh, decode that because I know you're familiar with it, but people who are listening might not be. Writer's block was invented about 100 years ago. Before that, there was no such term and almost nobody was a writer for a living. So you wrote when you felt like writing and it was Percy Shelley who um, had been married to the woman who wrote Frankenstein he was the first person to talk about this idea that there was some magical force from the outside, the muse, that made some people able to write and everybody else should stop pretending, which is nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. Everybody has at least once done something original and important and generous. At least once you have said something that is worth hearing, which means that if you can do it once, you can do it again. And my argument about writer's block is what we're really saying when we say I have writer's block is we're saying I am afraid of showing people my bad writing. Because if you have the ability to do bad writing, you're not blocked. It's just not very good. And if you do enough bad writing, some good writing will sneak in. And so writer's block is simply a trap or a place to hide. And what we really need to do is understand that our grandparents, when they did work, they had to dig a ditch. They had to lift a heavy object. When we do work, we have to do something that is emotionally difficult, not physically difficult, but we shouldn't pretend it's going to be easy every day because it's not. This brings me back to the, the, what the, the, the premise of the practice, this the premise of creating daily, creating all the time and shipping all the time, which is precisely what you've um, you've you've described right now. That you know sometimes it's not always about creating, it's not always about 
being the best writer that you can be at the time, but getting better all the time as you do it. Is that the, the, is that the, would that be a correct assessment of what the practice is or a practice in general or building it? Well, there's lots of things to decode about the idea of a practice, but I will tell you that I have never published anything where I said, that's perfect. Never once. Never once have I said, uh, that is so good. I don't need to do anything else to it. That the idea of the practice is not that we will get the perfect. It's that we will get to generous. That maybe you can do something that someone else will say thank you for. And to hold back on generosity because we're afraid is selfish. And so if we view this as a generous practice, that what we're here to do is open doors for other people, turn on lights for other people, it gets much easier to show up with our imperfect work on a regular basis. The fear of criticism causes a lot of people, um, including myself, not to create and stand out. Can you talk us through what you mean in the book when you write that leaders are imposters? So I don't know how it is where you live, but around here, imposter syndrome is a big deal. And imposter syndrome is this concept first codified about 50 years ago that says deep down, we feel like a fake, a fraud, somebody who isn't qualified to do our work. And there's lots of people online who will teach you how to make imposter syndrome go away. And I don't think that's possible. And the reason it's not possible is because if you're leading, it means you're doing something that hasn't been done before. And of course you feel like an imposter because you are one. You are not qualified. That even a heart surgeon has never operated on this particular heart before. That there is no guarantee that she will succeed. She's an imposter asserting that she can make a difference for this patient. If we need a guarantee, we should go to work at McDonald's. For the rest of us, there's the chance instead to say, I feel like an imposter and that's a good sign because it means I'm leading. Because, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm getting the sense that even in, even in leadership, there are instances or, or, or times when you yourself feel not qualified to lead, not qualified to be in that position, but by taking, um, taking the, the baton as it is and, and leading, that's when you constantly become and grow and build leadership. I only feel like an imposter when I'm doing something important. So if I don't feel import, like an imposter, I realize I'm hiding. That if all we're doing is phoning it in again and again, then we are not leading because leading is doing something new. You can't phone that in. You have to lean into the possibility that it might not work. And that moment is when we do our best work. You also talk about um, trusting the process in the book um, and trusting the process can often be hard when you are by yourself creating in a silo um, without um, a sounding board. How does one create and stick with a process that they, are, that they are building and developing? So you shouldn't steal your content. You shouldn't steal your creative work, but you should steal your process. You should find a process that has worked for other people that has been proven to work. Steve Pressfield has a great one. Isaac Asimov had a great one. You put your butt in the seat for six hours a day. If you put your butt in the seat for six hours a day and type something sooner or later, you will write something worth reading. There are many other processes that are available. Go find a process that has worked for other people. Then when it means to trust the process, it's not that there's a guarantee it's going to work. It simply means you picked something that is more likely to work than not having a process. And if we lean into the process and consistently embrace the process, we're probably going to get to where we're going. If you want to run a marathon, you don't say, I'll wait till I'm in the mood. And then you try to run 26 miles. If you want to run a marathon, you say, how have other people trained for this? Because if I train the way they trained, I'm probably going to be able to run a marathon. Over the years, you've written nearly 9,000 posts on your blog. Um, you collaborate with other creators from across the globe and marketers from across the world as well. 
how would you describe your process? Um, because again, when you create so much and so many times, you must have a process that works. You definitely have a process that works and you've proven your process time and time again. First of all, has it changed over the years and how would you describe it? Yes, it has changed. And there are different parts of my process. I think every successful creator has more than one process. So I have a process for my blog. And the process is I decided 20 years ago that there was going to be a blog post tomorrow from me. I only made that decision once. Once I've already decided, I now have to keep a promise. Knowing that there's going to be a blog post every day makes me think differently during the day because I know there's going to be a blog post tomorrow. Not because I feel like it, but because it's tomorrow. Not because it's perfect, but because it's tomorrow. So that's my most visible process. In terms of a process for how I find something to think about, talk about, write a book about, it's do I see something in the world that I don't understand? Something that is clearly there that doesn't lend itself to an easy explanation. If it exists, I need to explain it. First, I explain it to myself. And then if I think other people would like to hear the explanation, I explain it to them. And I do that all day, every day. So what, what, I, what I get reading your, um, your books year on year when they launch and read your blog alongside the books is that sometimes the ideas that you've been writing about for that year or that two-year period are different from the, ultimately the idea that comes out in a book. So, I mean, and, and also you run courses. So I'm imagining that there are many creative ideas that you nurture at a given time, that you nurture and build on at any given time. How do you know when an idea is worth pursuing and nurturing? And when do you know when it's not worth um, chasing up anymore? I have no idea. I'm terrible at it. And not only am I terrible at it, but the people who I rely on are even worse. So two of my most successful books are Purple Cow and The Dip. And my publisher didn't want to publish either one of them. And he's the best there is. And he said, nah, I'll do this because you want me to, but I really want the next one. And so nobody knows. Nobody knows. And you, I'm lucky enough that I get to get up to bat a lot of times. And it's easier than ever to get up to bat. That's an American baseball expression, but you can look it up. Um, you know, the idea that you don't have to pay a very high price to put ideas into the world, that's pretty new. And I think we should take advantage of it. In, in your workshops and in the work that you do with various creators uh, from across the globe and with people, um, you know, who read your books and you interact and engage with um, through your talks as well, what do you find is the biggest hindrance to launching uh, and creating a new idea, both in the workplace and outside? I think it depends on who it is. I am well aware of how much privilege I have being from the United States, being born the way I was born in the year that I was born. Um, and so I can't imagine what it's like to not get the benefit of the doubt and not have certain resources. But if we set that aside for a minute, I would say by far in both places, the biggest impediment is the story we tell ourselves. That if there's anybody in your company who's been able to lead, then clearly it's not an internal politics problem. It's they decided to, and you did it. And if you live in a place where anybody has ever written a blog post or a book or made a YouTube video or hosted a generous podcast like this, and you haven't, well, it's not the system because someone else did it. So what is the story we are telling ourselves that we use to talk ourselves out of generous leadership? We have to work on that story. In certain instances, it, it becomes really difficult and complex to, I think, to, to first of all, sell ideas in the workplace, new ones that may change a market in an industry. Um, and part of it is, of course, you know, sticking to, I suppose, the, 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 a practice and this idea of constantly being 
um, the, the one who agitates for ideas and constantly being a person who comes up with these new ideas, how would you, uh, how, what would advice would you have for a creator in the workplace for, for them to agitate and constantly agitate for new ideas and don't give up, um, even, you know, even in the midst, in the midst of resistance. Yeah. I think in the workplace, the secret is generosity. If you give away credit and you take responsibility, it's so much easier to get an idea to move forward. If other people take the credit, if you take the blame, it's more likely people will try it. And if you develop a track record as being that kind of person, they'll ask you for more. Many of the people who are agitating for ideas in the workplace constantly are saying, I want you to change everything. I don't want to take any responsibility and I want to make sure I get credit. And it's not a surprise that those people don't get much traction because the organization doesn't want that. So it goes back to this, I think that this concept of generosity and being generous with the ideas that you're bringing in and not necessarily wanting to take all the credit and none of the, call it blame, um, should they be failure. One of the things that I get um, as, as a big idea in, uh, in your other book, uh, This Is Marketing, you write about finding and building your smallest viable audience. And as a marketer, as somebody who deals with brands all the time, I find that brands want, want bigger. They want more. They want this. They want that. They don't want the smallest viable audience that you talk about in, in This Is Marketing, right? So... Um, and just for context as well, I've also noticed in the past, I noticed it more in the past three years, um, three or four years where brands have been getting a lot of backlash for being exclusive or for focusing on a smallest viable audience or for focusing on an audience that they want to build. How, how do you build this, build and maintain the smallest viable audience while remaining inclusive and, and weathering the storms of backlash that come through to you? Well, those are, are two different things. So let's take them one at a time. What I would say to the board of directors, the shareholders, the boss is, would it be okay if we were as successful and profitable as Starbucks or Nike or, um, you know, and name your favorite version of uh, online success story? Because all of those organizations and all of those brands began by serving a small group of people. In the case of Starbucks, still to this day, more than half the people in my country don't go to Starbucks, more than half. That Nike built a multi, multi-billion dollar company by appealing to a certain emotional mindset among a certain very small group of athletes. That was all. So I can't name a successful organization that began by saying, we make stuff for everybody, average stuff for average people. Doesn't happen. That's not how it's done. And so if you want to get big, the best way to get big is to matter to a small group. The second half of your question, I am, I've never once said that you should be yeah. exclusive yeah. based on demographics, based on what Absolutely. people look like, right? Yes, what I'm arguing yes. for is to be focused on a mindset. We are going over there. We make this. Yeah. For people who want that, please come with us. If you don't want that, we're not going to bother you. And mm -hmm. that is different than saying those other people aren't good. Those other people don't belong here. That's not what I'm arguing Absolutely. For. What I'm arguing yes, for is yes. who wants to go somewhere and how can we help them get there? I get that. I get that. And, and I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's the concept, uh, from the book that people like us do things like this, uh, or people like us. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's once again, it's once again, building and developing a tribe, but finding a way to develop that tribe in a way that is focused on the tribe and people identify with your message. Who you are much more likely to find a tribe that already exists than you are to build one. So the group of runners that Nike served was there before Nike got there. The group of, you know, 
upper income urbanites that Starbucks served before they are, they, that group existed before Starbucks got there. Apple computer served nerds. The nerds were there before Apple. So you're organizing and connecting people who are already seeking to be organized and connected. So the, so the tribe already exists. You, you, you do a lot more work in, in organizing that tribe and, and enabling those people to connect through your message, through your brand and products. Correct. That's exactly right. So one of the other things that is, um, that's happening quite a lot in the spaces that I interact and engage in and, and, and a lot of my peers are also seeing similar things. And one of these things, especially in B2B brands, because I want to talk about B2B brands versus consumer brands and, and, and the idea of building this, um, this tribe, um, can B2B brands humanize themselves in their messaging while remaining relevant? I asked this question off the back of the fact that a lot of the time when a B2B brand wants to market itself to other businesses, it tends to it tends to want to communicate its message about a business or about business in general, rather than consumer facing brands that have that emotive side, that have that human side. How do B2B brands humanize themselves a bit more than they currently are when communicating with, with you know, other businesses that they're marketing themselves to? This is a great question. I'm not sure I want to use the word humanize. You know, why would any business, a person in a business, buy something that's marketed in a B2B way? And the only reason is so they can tell their boss that unless you're buying what you bought last time or getting it cheaper, you have to tell your boss something to justify what you did. What will I tell my boss? So when people switched to Slack to have a conversation, creating a multi-billion dollar B2B brand, Slack wasn't a human brand, but Slack gave humans a story to tell their boss. And that is the secret that unlocks the success of any B2B brand. What will I tell my boss? I'm also seeing that uh, some of those brands particularly tend to shy away from, from showing a face or from being having a face for the business um i'm not again i suppose i mean the the, the only way that i can think to put that is this humanization or, or, or having a human um you know as the positioning or at least positioning your business in the marketplace how do those brands who who, who have traditionally not done that start thinking of ways to position themselves that way. Yeah. Um, I'm just not sure that that is a reliable way forward. I think okay. if we look at, you know, the, the, the lesson of Elon Musk, um, putting his face on a brand, a luxury, good and expensive technological item helped enormously in building the stock in the company. He was Henry Ford at the beginning. But I don't think anyone can argue he has helped one bit in the last six months because he's a human. He has his needs diverge from the company's needs. And, you know, at the beginning of Salesforce, Mark Benioff was in front of the brand a lot. But it's hard for lots and lots of companies to embrace Mark Benioff because Mark Benioff isn't Salesforce and Mark Benioff is definitely not their company. They need it to be more of a blank slate to make it about them. It's not about him. It's about them, right? Like mm. Picasso or Miles Davis, that's about the creator. But a B2B brand is about the user. And so the, face, the face that you want on a B2B brand is the face of the customer. That's a, that's a, that's a very, that's a fascinating insight uh, for me. Um, are there any are there any strategies that have come up or that you've kind of um, stumbled upon uh, to win client trust in, in, in ways that prove that 
less or, or a small viable audience is better than more. It's better than numbers because one of the things, again, one of the challenges um, that, that we find being, I suppose, on the agency side or on the creative side, talking to brands is that brands and brand owners have always been taught that, you know, reach, reach millions. What are some strategies to convince them otherwise? So let's think about smallest viable audience from your point of view. So if you, I'm just guessing that you have clients. If you don't have clients, some of the people who are listening to this have clients. How many clients do you need exactly? 10, 20, 30, 30 clients would be a lot. So if someone Absolutely. doesn't get the, if someone doesn't get the joke, fire them. Be really clear about what you do and don't sign on people who don't get it. That we're not trying to persuade people that they're wrong. We're trying to find people who already are on the journey we're on. Do you want your brand to matter to someone? Do you think that brands like this, this, and this are worth emulating? Do you want to follow a path to get you from here to there? If you don't, here are the numbers of five ad agencies you should call where they will waste your money. But if you do, that's what we do. Come with us if you want. No, that that makes uh, that makes perfect sense, and 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 definitely something that will 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 uh, you know will bring up to some of the brands that we interact and and, and engage with. Um, another thing that that I find um, that I find sort of challenging uh, for marketers, or at least for us as marketers, um, interacting and engaging with brands uh, once again is this idea um, that. Th this idea of community uh, and this idea of building a community. What I know, what I know about you and your work is that you do the opposite of what a lot of brands do, which, especially on social media, which is what they post, they say post two, three times a day, X number of times a week, do this and do that. And yet you do the opposite and your message carries through to the right people. What, what's the, what, what's the, not the right way to do it, but what's the strategy around, around not chasing your tail using platforms because that's what's said in, in modern marketing, but, but actually building instead of, instead of doing that and instead of being everywhere all the time. So the origin is uh, 40 years ago, you needed to buy ad time and you should buy as much as you could afford because it would pay for itself. And then they made ad time, quote, free, unquote. It's like a buffet. Take all you want. Eat as much as you can. And guess what? You're not the only one who has discovered that it's free. And so you have all of these organizations and individuals who say, wow, it's a buffet. I'll post some more. I'll post some more. I'll post some more. And they're doing the same thing. And as a result, social media is a mess. It's chaotic. And... If you want to stand for someone who's a little louder than all the other loud people, you could sign up for that, but you better be a little louder than all the other loud people. That's exhausting. And I just decided a long time ago, I didn't want to work for free for Twitter, work for free for Facebook, work for free for LinkedIn. I wanted to say for the people who want to share what I have to say, here it is. And you can count on me to be here once a day, once. And that pattern builds trust. It builds attention, but it doesn't make me famous. I'm not trying to be famous. I'm trying to narrate for my smallest viable audience. It seems like a million people is a lot, but on a percentage basis, it's not very many at all, but it's enough. And I don't spend any time at all trying to make it bigger. Hmm. What did this, this time of the, the pandemic, everybody being at home, people not interacting and engaging, um, what did that time, sh I think, I think show or, or, or prove to you about how we market and about how we communicate? I asked this off the back of the fact that you have always been, you know, online, you've been working online, you've been doing a lot of things on the internet that are exactly the same <laughs> in many ways, the same, that the same way that people were doing things during the pandemic. How did that time shift your your thinking um and in what ways did it shift your thinking and realizations about people 
I, I don't think I was surprised by too much of what I saw, heartbroken by a lot of what happened for a lot of people, but not surprised. I think that two things uh, are worth mentioning. One is we discovered that knowledge work does not require physical presence, that lots and lots of organizations did lots and lots of important things without coming together in a room. And the second thing is that it's much harder to do work when people are afraid. It's much harder to do work when people are in pain. And fear and pain are an epidemic. And one of the things that we can do is not make it worse, but make it better. That's, yeah, that, that, that's a, an interesting one. Um, and, and once again, I think we, we started, I suppose, appreciating the time that we spend outside of work than you know, then the time that we spend traveling to work and doing all of those, all of those kinds of things. I also noticed uh, that, you know, people started creating more, which is for me, which is why for me, the practice came out at sort of at the perfect time, because it was during that time when we were creating, when, when creativity began no longer being the work of the creative person, but the ambit of anybody and everybody wanting to make a difference. Yeah, I think that what we discovered is that everybody's a creative person. It's just that uh, a few people had the mantle before and the label, but you know, one of the single best things that has come out of social media is it has encouraged some people, not that many, but some people to share what they believe. Yes. Yes. That, 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 that was, that was um, very true. And I think it started out. Um, one of the things that it started out with quite a lot was was um with people cooking and doing all of those types of things um at home one of the other really big things that has changed i think the face of entertainment in my view which is where a lot of brands were positioning themselves and advertising to people and interrupting people is of course stream streaming platforms the growth of platforms like netflix disney plus um and all the rest of them right how is this in your view changing advertising where we can we are no longer interrupted by commercial breaks and also um, in the same breath enabling brands or the smart ones to build off of this lack or absence of interruption yeah i mean let's acknowledge advertising is almost dead compared to what it was 20 30 years ago that you can't name cannot name one brand anywhere in the world that was built in the last five years with advertising. They were built with the network effect. They were built with word of mouth. They were built with remarkability. They were built with direct interaction with consumers. None of those things would have worked in 1975, none of them. And so there are still some talented people in the ad business, but even the biggest ad agencies in the world, half of their income now comes from things that we don't call advertising. It comes yeah. from community outreach and media relations and storytelling and positioning and all the other things that matter so much more than advertising. You just, because first of all, if you're advertising online and I spent half a million dollars uh, on some of the workshops a couple of years ago, if you're advertising online, the minute it starts to work, someone else is going to do what you're doing and you're going to have to pay twice what you were paying before. It doesn't work like it used to. And so instead of saying advertising will save us, I think what we have to say is the product will save us. We have to lean into the product in a way that the product itself becomes the marketing. Another thing that we, we, we are finding, um, we're doing quite a lot um, in digital marketing right now is that brands will want to, uh, brands will want to interact and engage with an influencer, a content creator, this person or that person to kind of talk about them or to 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 advocate for a brand and some people have built careers uh as influencers um and i say influencers not content creators because i see i feel like there's a distinction um between the two what are your thoughts on this th the value of influencer marketing when more and when people are becoming more and more sought after if they are a good influencer. And as a result, they end up talking about more and more brands. 
there was a piece in the New York Times today about a woman who got herself arrested at the Super Bowl just so she could become an influencer. And it was pathetic and heartbreaking. Influencers aren't really influential in the long run because it's hard to scale. As soon as you start taking money to recommend stuff, you're going to start taking money for stuff that's not worth recommending. And as soon as you recommend some things that aren't worth recommending, people are going to trust you less. And so instead of viewing influencer as a category of profession, I think what we need to say is there are curators who are patient and insightful and generous who can make a decent living for a long time. But the idea that you're cute, you have a lot of following on Instagram, and you're going to just cash out for a long time, that might work for the Kardashians, but we already have the Kardashians. We don't need another one. And so I am not bullish on influencer marketing as a lifestyle or profession. I do think there are some brands who have been smart about how to buy off people who are willing to be bought off. And that has bought them some short-term attention, which maybe they can compound into something that really works. But I think we have to be very careful about these sort of easy paths to fame and fortune, because if it's easy, it's probably not useful. Absolutely. Seth, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it always. Um, and once again, you, you left us with a lot to think about a lot to, to kind of, um, to rethink and, and, and to go back to the drawing board and, and talk to clients about, um, in a different way in closing how do people how do people cut through the noise i mean i know you get asked this quite a lot how do people cut through the noise now when there's so much noise on so many platforms well first i want to thank you for the work you do and i think that you are an example for so many people about what it means to be consistent and persistent and generous and the way you cut through the noise is the way someone like you cuts through the noise which is you're not doing the cutting your listeners are your listeners are telling other people because when we are talking to our peers, there's no noise. And so the goal is not, how do I go and grab a stranger and shake them and yell at them? It's how do I help someone who already trusts me and listens to me and create the conditions so that they can tell someone else? And it's that horizontal spread of ideas that is changing our culture. Not the top-down yelling, but the people telling other people. Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. It was absolutely amazing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Keep making a ruckus. It was good to talk to you. We'll see you.